morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, as always, I hope to give you information that will be useful. Uh, I, 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 there's a lot of information out there, but before we get into all that, uh, first let me say thank you, a deep, heartfelt thank you to Debbie Cavalier, Karen Nuremberg, especially for that kind introduction, and Steve Harding for just making it so easy to work with them. They are such fine people, and they run such a, an incredible program here with Berkeley Online. There, there is really a joy to say yes to any anything they ask you to do because uh, they are they just so have it together. So it's a it's a real pleasure, and I'm grateful to them. Uh, thanks also to Roger Brown for steering our ship in a course that uh, allows us to feel supported as faculty members and allows us to feel like we're moving in the right direction. I completely agree with his assessment that the music industry is looking up. I, I really, really believe that. I think this is, this is a great time to be in music as an artist. It's different from what it was in my generation in the 80s and 90s. We made some big money then, but I have a feeling that um, we'll make big money again. Just give it some time. It's, this is blooming from the ashes of what came before. So today what I want to talk with you about is uh, career strategies and success and things like that. Uh, in particular, I'd like to talk with you about it from the perspective of the Dark Horse Project. It wasn't my project, I was just featured in it. So Dark Horse, as you're going to see in a little bit, the Dark Horse Project was uh, um, an initiative by a couple of Harvard researchers. And these Harvard researchers were interested in success, modern success. So what they did is they found some folks like me who had success, but achieved it through a very unusual career path. Um, my career path, if you'd looked at it on paper, it didn't look anything like something that would turn out to be a great success. <laughs> and yet, despite all that, I managed to achieve great success. Uh, big royalty checks for bare naked ladies and, and a PhD at age 52 and all kinds of wonderful things. Um, but on paper, that would not have looked very possible. So how did that happen? The Dark Horse guys, uh, Todd Rose and Ogi Ogas, found me and they found some others and they wrote a book. I'll show you the cover of it in a slide in just a moment. Anyway, they're talking about the elements of success that are underappreciated. Uh, I like their thesis, I'm proud to be featured in it, and it gave me inspiration to talk with you all about your careers. So I just returned last night from Narandera, Australia. It was really wonderful. Uh, I gave a production workshop. I produced a young artist, his name is Ben, and he's very, very talented. He's got a voice like Sam Smith, and he, uh, let me check my watch real quick, to make sure I don't go too long. Okay, now I'm good. Uh, he's got a voice like Sam Smith, but he, he writes songs like Ed Sheeran, and very, very good. He's a, he's, he's, he's a genuinely talented artist but he's in Narandera, Australia. It's really small. He's got product, but he has a big dilemma of how to get that product and to a, a waiting audience, how to get people to pay him for his work. He's got an even bigger problem in that as we were doing a little bit of pre-production, I was doing what a producer does and I was giving him the choices. You know, we can do it like this or we can do it like this or we can do it like this and here are the different outcomes. And I mentioned the word commercial. You know, if we took this approach, it would be more commercial. And he said something that I have heard from artists over and over and over again. He said, oh, I don't know, commercial, that's a dirty word. I didn't say anything, but I thought, son, <laughs> Commerce, commerce is not a dirty word. Commerce means trade. Commerce means uh, you're putting your art out there and someone's giving you something for it. They're giving you money. They're giving you attention. They're giving you what you want so you can have this career. I thought, boy, I, I would like to spend some time with him and disabuse him of the notion that making money from your art pollutes it. It doesn't pollute it. It allows you to it allows it to thrive, it allows it to foster. But I didn't say anything. Uh, later on, I think I was able to change his mind. The flip side of that was a recent conversation I had with a young woman, not a member of Berkeley, but she's a young, 
young musician and she had heard about me and she wanted to have a phone conversation. So we had a phone conversation and it turned out this young woman is apparently from a independently wealthy family, I, I guess, because she's 27 years old and she's living in New York. She doesn't have much product at all, but what she has is a publicist and a manager and an entertainment attorney. And as we talked and talked and talked, I realized she's got all the infrastructure of success, but with no product. Whereas Ben, the other, on the other hand, has product. He's, he's a good songwriter and none of the infrastructure. Both of these young people were making assumptions about how success works. And, and those were somewhat, to the best of my understanding, false assumptions. I have had some success, but I've worked with people who've been hugely successful. And I'm friends with folks who've been very successful, and that includes Prince and Bare Naked Ladies, and it, it includes uh, uh, the, the producers like Greg Kirsten and Greg Wells, and, and people who've had these great long careers. Um, I assure you, we were not thinking like Ben, nor were we thinking like this young woman who armed herself with all the trappings of success before she had any of the goods. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Some thoughts on success. Ah. We start when we're young, we're encouraged to do this. Think about what do I want? What do I want? We start asking that question when we're very little, and it seems to be a really important question when we reach our teens and then our young adulthood. Sometimes things go badly, you get off to a bad start, and you're compelled to ask yourself over and over again, yeah, this didn't work out, what do I want? I would argue that that's not the question we need to be asking ourselves first. I think, and the thesis in the Dark Horse book is similar, the better question is, who am I? Who am I? So the no game, it says here, do I want to be a freelancer? No. Do I want to be a consultant? Do I want to work for a big company? Do I want to work one-on-one -on -one with people? The yes game. Do I want to create things? Do I want to document my journey? Do I want to keep switching projects? Blah, blah, blah. I took this from a website that helps you answer the question with these yes or no questions of what do I want? Well, this was uh, Todd and Ogie's book. Ogie Ogos is such a cool name. <laughs> I love that. Oh, he's a great guy, too. So this is their book that came out last October, Achieving Success Through the Pursuit of Fulfillment. And I'm going to summarize their main thesis in this talk today. Years ago, uh, I was with my friend, the musician Tommy Jordan, and we were sitting on a beach in Long Island, and we had the Sunday New York Times Magazine, and a very famous musician who, I, I won't mention her name, I don't want to embarrass her, but she was somewhat famous. You know, there's the A-list celebrity, she was an A-minus list celebrity. You'd know her name if I said it. Anyway, we're sitting there and we're reading this article. Uh, she was profiled in the New York Times Sunday Magazine, and this woman was bitter. She was angry. She was really angry because she believed she was more of a genius and more talented than her success indicated. She thought she should be bigger and on the top of the pop charts. And she was very angry at the general public for not recognizing that she was a genius and that her, her songs deserved to sell more than the pop music of the day. And we're sitting there and we're reading this article and sitting next to me is Tommy and Tommy just looked up and he said, well, it depends on what her definition of success is. And I thought, yeah, you're absolutely right. By anyone else's standards, this woman is hugely successful. You would know her name. She's been having successful records for many, many years. But her definition of success included basically queen of the charts. And she was unhappy because she didn't achieve that. It's really important for all of us when we embark on a profession, in fact, when we embark on life, it's really important to define what success looks like to you. You may not get all of the elements of it. If it includes a spouse and children, 
If it includes a, a stable place to live where you're not moving all the time, maybe it includes living in the country or a, a suburbs or something like that, not smack in the heart of the big city. If it includes all of those things, it may not include other things. The young man who I mentioned, Ben, who lives in Narandera, Australia, is probably going to have to move to the big city. He'll probably have to move to Sydney or Melbourne. It's not going to happen for him in Narandera. That's a simple truth. So his definition of success may have areas that are competing with one another. We're going to have to figure out for ourselves what success looks like if we ever are going to have any hope of attaining it. So whose definition of success are you using? Make sure that it is yours and make sure that you arrived at it from a place of honesty. And, and, and by honesty, I mean um, not delusional. There was a student um, that I met through Berkeley Online some years ago who uh, made the statement to me in a chat room. He said, I am as great of an artist as any artist who has ever lived. I thought he was joking. And uh, I, I said, yeah, 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 you must be pretty good. And he said it again, I am as great as any artist who has ever lived. And I said, you mean like Beethoven and the Beatles, like that great? And he said, yes. And I said, wow, I really have to hear your music because I like great music. And he sent it to me, and it wasn't great. <laughs> I'm sad to say it wasn't good. He suffered from the inability to assess his product in the marketplace of ideas, in the commercial marketplace of what people want. In, uh, in our case, what we're talking about is music, but we have to agree that uh, the, the general public, all of us with a human brain in this room, have different appetites, but we all could probably agree that Beethoven was great, as were the Beach Boys and as were the Beatles. We know what greatness is. Uh, we need to know that in ourselves. Anyway, this is what uh, Todd and Ogie wrote about in the book. The standardization covenant is the standard party line of what success looks like. So a lot of times you'll be uh, talking with people and you'll tell them what you're pursuing and they'll tell, tell them you're in school and folks might ask things like, well, what's your GPA? Where'd you go to college? Where do you work? What's your title? How high did you climb the corporate ladder? And this is the one that we record makers just cannot stand when people ask you, have you done anything I might have heard of? <laughs> what they're saying is, that's my rubric for what success is, so do you meet that rubric? It's an important question in their minds. But is it really an important question? The Dark Horse Covenant would suggest suggest that rather than pursue success for its own sake, according to that standard, that set of criteria for what success looks like, maybe it would be smarter to pursue fulfillment. Maybe it would be smarter to just be the best version of yourself and to learn to seize opportunities that fit you. I was featured in this book because that's exactly what I've done. Um, when, I, when I was young and growing up in Orange County, California, there was no money in my family for college. It simply wasn't going to happen. And I, I have to say, I say it with some pride, that um, my father set the bar very low for my brothers and me. Success was a job. <laughs> Just get a job. We were a blue collar family. I joke that our family crest has a, a delivery van on it with a guy driving a van. <laughs> I'm proud of that. Uh, for my brothers, that, that's what they did. They got a job, and they worked their way up through that job, and they, they married good women, and they had good children, and they lead good lives, and they're very successful. For me, though, I knew that that just wouldn't I wouldn't be happy because I had an itch that I wanted desperately to scratch. I wanted to be where people were making records. I, I knew that I wasn't a musician, that was very clear. I knew that um, 
I wasn't an artist. I could feel it inside. More about that later that's coming up. Uh, but I could feel that's not me, but what I am. I kind of had a sense that I'm good at building things and at helping people with their projects. If they come to me with an idea, I'm pretty good at helping them actually physically make it. So I pursued a career in the music business so I could be where records were being made. The success that I achieved was greater than, trust me when I say this, greater than my wildest dreams. I did not see that coming. I just wanted to be able to do this for a living. But because I was so focused on fulfillment, I kept um, being fulfilled. That happiness helped to fuel the next opportunities that came my way. As um, I reached my mid-40s and I realized uh, everything's going well, I'm really happy with this, I've been doing this for 22 years now, however, I'm no longer listening to college radio. In your 40s, why would you? Well, there's good reasons, I suppose, why you would, but it didn't, it, it didn't, it didn't it, I suppose I could have forced myself to do it, but the voice that was inside me didn't want to listen to college radio anymore. The voice that was inside me started thinking a lot about the natural world, and I was thinking about consciousness in other species, and I just couldn't let the idea go. I just couldn't let it go. It was just lighting up my Christmas tree the same way that music had when I was a little kid, and so I knew I, I need fulfillment. I have to do it. So in 1998, when I had a big hit record as a producer with Bare Naked Ladies, got that big royalty check, I did what uh, not too many people would do with a big royalty check. I quit my job. I quit my job so I could enter college as a freshman. Uh, at age 44 in the year 2000, I entered college as a freshman, and I went for eight straight years, and I got the PhD. I, it's, it's great. Uh, it's not, it's not, it, yeah, it, it's, ha, had I stayed in the music business, in hindsight, it looks like I was a genius, because had I stayed in the music business, I would have had to suffer like all my, my friends did with the collapse of the industry and Napster and all that. And uh, boy, a lot of my, my friends were, were out of work for a long time, and you know those paychecks went right down. But I entered into a totally new field, and I'm happy. It's not the big money, it's not the yacht, it's not the, oh, I've got a little villa in Rome. It's, it's not the vacations in Hawaii, but it wasn't money that I was pursuing. What I was pursuing was artistic fulfillment. I, I'm just curious about stuff, and I like reading about it and studying it. That's what I wanted to do, so that is what I did. As they say in the book, in Dark Horse, it is important to know your micro motives. So rather than ask the question, what do I want? As I said before, it might be smarter to ask, who am I? What do I like? Uh, they feature in this book, Corinne. She says, uh, Corinne it was hugely successful in politics, actually. And she worked for the fir first Bush administration. And then she was invited to come and be some bigwig with uh, the other George Bush president. And, uh, and she said, you know what? I just, I can't stand it. I'm good at it and they pay me well, but I can't stand it. What I really like is I like to organize physical spaces. I just like that. I like organizing closets. So she started a company in New York where she organizes closets. And she's successful and she's happy. The business is going really well. Another woman, Diana, said, I like to classify living things. I like that. I like that kind of work. I like, you know, having the chart with all the insects and like the taxonomy and stuff. Well, that sounds like fun. She uh, left a very successful, successful by the Standard Covenant job and started Pioneer Valley Mycological Association. Alvaro says, I've always liked birds. I've always liked birds. He started Alvaro's Adventures. He takes people bird watching. Saul says, you know what I really like? And Saul's got a couple of PhDs. I believe he was associated with MIT, a physicist. But what he decided was, you know, I really like aligning physical objects with my hands. That's my thing. I really like doing that thing. And he started an upholstery company, Fiber New Upholstery Repair. He's the upholstery repair guy to the stars. <laughs> Very successful company. For me, growing up, uh, uh, this has been my micro motive since I was very young. I like helping musicians make things. I don't feel competitive with them. I don't want to be on the other side of the glass. I genuinely like helping them achieve their vision. Feels good. 
Many folks will tell you to follow your passion. Well, how do you know where it's going? <laughs> uh, for dark horses, passion is multidimensional. It's not a straight path. It's dynamic, it's changeable, and it's under intentional control. We all have a lot of passions. Uh, you've probably had classes with Enrique Gonzalez Muller. Enrique is a foodie. He's passionate about food. I know myself well enough to know that I'm not passionate about that. I'm passionate about art. I love the art museums. I really am crazy about, these days anyway, abstract art. Uh, it just rocks my world. I know what I love. I'm passionate about literature. Knowing what lights you up will help you find a profession where you can be the best version of yourself, where you can ultimately get paid to be yourself. Uh, the other thing that lights me up is animals. Uh, d d d waking up yesterday morning in, in Australia and having coffee and looking outside the window and seeing the kangaroos, they consider them pests because they run across the highway, but to me, <laughs> they're just, just like a big giant mouse. Oh, they're fabulous. So passion is, you don't have to be passionate about just one thing. Of course I'm passionate about music, and of course I'm, I'm passionate about animals. I'm passionate about a lot of other things too. They all have a, a, a common source down deep inside. We need to recognize that and be proud of it. Following your passion is fairly easy, but engineering your passion, getting paid to be who you are, takes work. When you know yourself, your true nature, you realize that your passion is infinitely flexible and you can quit your job and, and, and carry on, carry on in a, in a whole new course. Uh, life and different opportunities are going to activate different of your micro motives, whether you're living in the city or the country or whether you're sur surrounded by other students or you're kind of a lone wolf out there. In that case, if you're in touch with what like, lights you up, your passion becomes sustainable. You're in touch with it, as you are with your creativity. I'm going to step away for a couple of slides from Dark Horse because I want to share with you a lecture that I got from this man when I was in grad school, and this totally rocked my world. As Bill Verplank was giving us this lecture in grad school, it really made me think about the music business. In his case, he was talking about folks he knew. He was talking about Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and Bill Gates and Paul Allen, because Bill Verplank is from Silicon Valley. He's credited, if you look up his Wikipedia entry, as being one of the inventors of the computer mouse. His specialty is computer user interfaces. Anyway, Bill came to McGill and he gave us this lecture and it is germane to what we're talking about today. Knowing your mind and knowing what kind of thinker you are. As Bill gave this lecture, it helped me realize the difference between bare naked ladies who sold five million copies of the stunt album and the band Gegita that I worked with for many years who sold 5,000 copies. If only we had known. So Bill went to the whiteboard and he drew this quadrant on the whiteboard. And he was talking about archetypes. He was talking about archetypal thinkers, what kind of mind you have. As I mentioned earlier, I said, I knew, I just could kind of sense when I was young, I wasn't meant to be a musician. I loved music with a passion, but my parents thought, okay, great, and they bought a piano and they had me take piano lessons, and I just remember taking those piano lessons and thinking, this is not resulting in fun for anyone. I don't like doing this. They don't like listening to it. The teacher knows that I'm not an engaged student. This didn't feel right. What I loved was listening to the radio and listening to records. I kind of knew on some level as much as I would like to, sure, it would be wonderful to be on stage and be leading a band and holding the microphone and uh, you're the great singer or uh, I fantasize about this all the time. What if I were a great jazz piano player? What I wouldn't give to be able to sit at the piano and to be a great jazz piano player or guitarist or drummer or just whatever, but I knew inside it's not me. I am not the artist. The archetypal artist is the inventor, the person who thinks of things de novo from the new, the 
artist was thought in ancient times to actually be blessed by the gods because we didn't know where creativity came from. So that it was thought that the muses sat on your shoulders or the gods blessed you and they gave you this great talent. They gave you these great ideas. If you are an artist, you are going to be idea oriented. You think of things that don't exist. You're excited by a blank page rather than terrified by it. You're a risk taker and you're a visionary. Um, Steve Jobs, in this lecture, Steve Jobs was the archetypal visionary artist, a creative thinker. Artists have their heads in the clouds. So artists are great at thinking of things that uh, don't exist, but they are not especially great at actually making that thing that they've just thought of a physical reality. For that, they need another archetype. For that, they need the archetype of the engineer. Those are my people. An engineer is a person who is systems oriented, who thinks in terms of logic and reason and is generally often technical. Engineers build things. So when Steve Jobs has an idea for a new personal computer or a new iPhone, he's got brilliant ideas, but he has to take it to Steve Wozniak and say, Steve, I need it to do this, 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 and this. Steve Wozniak will come back to him and say, I can have it do this and this. Uh, and the third thing, yeah, it's physically possible, but it's gonna cost you a fortune. And the fourth thing defies the laws of physics. So we cannot build this that. Here's how you have to modify your vision to make something that will actually work. Well, it's the same thing in the music business. An artist like, uh, well, it might be uh, Ed Robertson and Stephen Page will say, this is the album we want to make. Or it might be Tommy Jordan and Greg Kirsten. This is the record we want to make. I worked with some really visionary artists, and that includes Prince. I was a good companion and partner for them because I didn't compete with them. When I worked with Geggy Tom, we worked at their home studio because I started my career as an audio technician. I could put together a home studio for them, and if the tape machine broke down, it, 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 it was not a problem. I didn't have to send out for someone else. I could repair it. I, I started my career as an uh, audio technician repairing consoles and tape machines. So I was a really good builder of things. I had, I had a, a deep knowledge. Same thing with Prince. But... When the artist and the engineer have gotten together and they've made a new computer or they've made a new record, you still have a problem. The problem is you have to sell it. You have to, ha you have to think in terms of commerce. Now, uh, artists aren't too clever about how the business world works. In fact, a lot of musicians just find that to be um, a little bit aversive, is even thinking about marketing and strategy and things like that. When you uh, go to an engineer, there's no way an engineer, <laughs> sorry folks, uh, for those of you who are, but this is us, this is our people, uh, we are not especially good at understanding complex human relationships. We tend to be socially awkward. When it comes to selling a record, the poor engineers uh, are not good at understanding that, and neither are the artists. We need another archetype if we want to connect with people. The archetype we need is the entrepreneur, someone who can launch a small business, someone who is people-oriented, someone who is very social by nature, who understands human nature, which is far more complex for the average engineer to understand, and someone who has leadership skills. Artists and engineers typically uh, don't want to avail themselves of any sort of leadership skills. We'd rather have others do it for us, so we need that entrepreneur. Someone who really knows people. Now, as Bill Verplank is giving this lecture, I'm thinking, I really don't get it. I've worked with really strong artists, without a doubt. I'm kind of covering my engineer end over here on the right. When working with Bare Naked Ladies, the entrepreneurial thing was really strong because the guys in the band were great. They were actually pioneers at reaching out to their fans. They had, um, and through Apple Computer, they partnered with Apple Computer in the 90s. Through Apple, they had, um, they had a, a, a fan chat room, and it was called the Ladies Room. So it was really cool. So if you were a fan, you could log on to the ladies' room. As we were making the stunt album in 1998, 21 years ago now, the guys would be in the studio with their laptops open, and whoever wasn't actually 
playing or singing, the other guys would be on their laptops communicating with fans in the ladies' room and saying, oh, Tyler just did this great percussion overdub, and we're going to have Ed redo the vocals for one week, but oh, it's coming out great. So they're very, very social, very entrepreneurial oriented. Uh, when I worked with, with Gegita, they were signed to David Byrne's label. Now, after Gegita's first album, I produced a David Byrne album, uh, with, I co-produced it, but I did a David Byrne record in New York City. When you're with David Byrne in New York City in the 90s, and it's Christmas time, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and you go to a lot of parties, you walk into any art party in New York with David Byrne, and you see the reaction. David is beloved, and people come over to him, David, what are you working on lately? Everybody knows David, everybody likes him in the New York art scene. So I didn't get it. Why did Bare Naked Ladies sell 5 million copies and Gagita 5,000 copies? These should have been equivalent. But unfortunately for Gagita, they were missing the fourth archetype, and Bare Naked Ladies had it. Bill Verplank said, as the angels are above, the devil is below. We didn't have, with Gagita, a competitor. Now, competitor is my word. The word that Bill used was bully. I think bully's not really a, an appropriate word. I think competitor is better because this person, this archetype, wants to win. That's their art. It's the art of being number one. It's the art of winning. These folks are driven and they are competitive. So many artists consider that kind of mind to be evil. <laughs> So when they don't want to be around, uh, I've, I've heard it said from many artists, they are uh, afraid of and suspicious of music business majors because they think that a music business major is just trying to take their money. They don't understand. No, a music business major is trying to make you money. Make you money. You need a competitor. Bare Naked Ladies had one. They had the great Terry McBride of Network Management. Uh, great, great new manager, and I am not shy about crediting Terry with the success of the stunt album. Of course, we all did our part, but I think Terry McBride had a huge, huge, huge um, mediating influence on that record's success. In contrast, Gegita made the common beginner's mistake. They were afraid to associate with people who were different from them. They were afraid to associate with a competitive, market-driven manager who wanted them to be number one because they thought, no, we don't associate with those kinds of people. And that was a big mistake. Um, the point of this, of why I want to share it with you, is because I think that's a useful lesson, but mainly because I want to come back to the point of knowing yourself and knowing what kind of thinker you are. Not all of us are artists. And if you are not, you will not stand a good chance against the ones who truly are. It is important if you are to have success as well as fulfillment and not spend a life in frustration. It's important to understand who you are down deep inside and take Take the pattern of thinking that you engage in, the type of thinking that you do, and use that to plug yourself in to a system with, as Roger said earlier, with other people, with other people so that collectively you have a greater chance of success. Bill Verplank's lecture emphasized that the most successful projects happen when people who are on the extremes of these archetypal patterns or these archetypal, what's the word I'm looking for? People who are these extreme archetypes, when those come together, you have the best chance of success. In other words, when the great visionary artists like a Steve Jobs or Stephen Page comes together with a great manager, great bully competitor, and comes together with a great engineer like a Steve Wozniak or, or, or Don Was, let's say, or maybe an Ed Cherney, and comes together with a great entrepreneur. And he mentioned Bill Gates and Paul Allen here as well. When those people come together, your product has the best chance of success out there in the market. So now back to Dark Horse. Let me check the time. Oh, we're doing great. Um, the Standard Covenant would say that risk is determined by the odds. 
as I told you, when I started out in my career, if I had written it down on paper, the odds would suggest that I would never be successful at anything. Uh, maybe moderately successful at my job, I suppose, but that would be a very blue collar job. Um, the odds of my being successful in the music business were astronomically low. I didn't know anyone in the music business. I was in Orange County, California. I didn't even know any musicians. Uh, I'm gonna be, be a record producer. So the odds were incredibly steep. Thank goodness I didn't look at that. <laughs> I looked instead at the fit. I was a good fit because I recognized from all that record listening that I had done when I was a kid that I wanted desperately to be where records were being made. And I also recognized, and this is something that's important, I recognized the stability of that desire. That desire didn't leave. It started at, it first appeared at about age eight. It's never gone away. It was stable, meaning that it was a product of gene expression, a product of, 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 of an eight, uh, inborn traits rather than an outside influence that made me think for a month, oh, this is a good idea, and then change my mind later. It's important to be in touch with who you are. And this is what they say in the book. The more of your micro motives that'll be activated by a particular opportunity, the greater the passion you're going to engineer by choosing that opportunity, and the lower the riskiness of your choice. Those micro motives refer to down deep inside, the little things that you want, not the big things. The straight path, they say, is safest only for those who fit the mold. And this is where luck comes in. The dark horse mindset grants you the power to influence risk, reducing the role of chance in your choices by knowing your micro motives and your strengths and yourself. That's a, that's a smart way to approach it. Uh, the, the risk will be greater when you're trying to compete in, a, in an arena with people who uh, are better suited for that particular task than you are. Engineering your purpose. Each time you make a meaningful choice based on your assessment of the fit between your micro motives and an opportunity, you are forging your own purpose. The standardized mindset would be saying uh, passively pick a career based on the odds of success, but the dark horse mindset would be actively pick a career by choosing one that fits your individuality, regardless of the odds. So what strategy is best? Well, there's no one best strategy for success or excellence. There is, however, a best strategy for you. Strategy is a method for getting better. Uh, you should always be improving yourself over time, always. Uh, I was at a um, Art of Record Production conference a few years ago. Tony Maserati was the keynote speaker, and he said something that made me just start to clap. Uh, it made me happy that he said it because I've been saying it to students for the longest time and I was glad to hear it from someone else. He said, if you're under 30 and not studying your craft every night, you don't belong in this business. I'm so glad he said that. Those of us who, I'm gonna focus on the record makers here, but it also applies to folks in business or, or in, uh, it applies to folks in music therapy, it applies to folks in any profession. Those of us who, who are in this field recognize that the field is constantly changing and that we have to be constantly studying in order to stay competitive and in order to stay good at it. When a, a, a young person is embarking on a career, there are three main things they need to know. Um, the first is two things rolled into one. It's the tools and the methodology. You need to know your tools, the tools of this profession, and how people use those tools. That's just the practical craft of what you do for a living. It can be playing piano or using a uh, using Pro Tools, or it can be if you're a surgeon, you know how to, how to use the tools in, involved in brain surgery. So you need the tools and the methodology. The second thing you need to know your entire career is the field, of course. In in the case of music, you need to know music. I get very very distressed when I see students here on Berkeley campus who can't really talk about any records, 
before they became aware of music. They can't really talk about anything that happened before they were in high school. That's really distressing, especially if you're a songwriter. If you're a songwriter and you think that music started with you, or if you think that music started just when you and your friends became aware of it, you're not going to be competitive out there in the world. The, the smarter folks recognize that everything, everything, law, politics, medicine, art has a trajectory, it has an arc. You came along right here, but what happened before you came along? Where has music been? Where is it going? It would be good advice to look at, for example, Rolling Stone magazines, uh, they make lists all the time, the 500 greatest albums of all time. I think I've got, I've got two records on that list, actually. A couple of Prince records, yeah. Look at, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love those, I love those lists. Uh, look at, Look at the 100 greatest guitar solos of all time or the 100 greatest songwriters of all time and look at how far, they ba how far back they go. We're going back to you know, modern pop rock soul music from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s and so on. All of that built up to where we are today. You won't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. Um, so you need to know the field, and in particular, you need to have an encyclopedic knowledge of the style of music that you work in. If you work in punk, you better know punk music. You better know punk music so that you can predict how punk is going to go. Um, the third thing that you need, tools and methodology, the field, but the third thing you need to know is your discourse community. How do, how, how do, what do, what do us, what do we look like? What do we talk about? What you're hoping to do in the music business is get behind the velvet rope where there are conversations going on. You want to be among those folks having those conversations. You want to be part of it. You need to eavesdrop on the conversations. To do that, every professional needs to be reading on a regular basis his or her professional journal. Uh, in, in psychology and in sciences, we have to read trends in cognitive sciences, and we have to read uh, uh, just the professional journals that come out. Uh, music perception is one of them, and psychomusicology is another. You, you do that to keep up with your discourse community, and you learn how we talk, and you learn our value system. If you're making records, it would be smart to read Mix Magazine on a regular basis, or Tape Op, or uh, go to Pensado's place, find these interviews online with people who are doing what you do. You are attempting to forge a path up a mountain where other people have already walked. Wouldn't it be smart to eavesdrop on their conversation and learn from them what did you encounter as you went up that path? Whether you're an artist or a record maker or music business uh, person and whatever, it would be smart to understand your discourse community so that when your turn comes to take part in that conversation, you'll be ready and you'll be interesting. That's what Tony Maserati meant by studying your craft every night. <clears throat> This slide is important, so I'll take a little bit of time with it. As they say in the Dark Horse book, it is very important early in your career to assess the degree of overlap between two things. One is your motives, what you want, but the other is your strengths, what you are. I believe that the way we know what we want and what we're good at is by daydreaming. I think that's what we do when we're children. You know how you're a little kid, you could stare at your, the pattern on your bedspread or read the back of a cereal box for hours. I remember from my day uh, when records were you know, 12 inches by 12 inches, listening to records and just staring at that cover and at the back, at the liner notes and at the credits. I just knew, I just knew this is what I want. But I also knew when I read those credits, some little voice inside said, I'm gonna remember the name of that engineer. That's the engineer's name. I'm gonna remember that name. That's understanding what you want in a broad sense, the sort of field you'd like to be in, medicine, law, music, dance. 
and then knowing what contribution you can make based on the kind of thinker that you are. Destinations are great for institutions, but they can be catastrophic for fulfillment. The standardized mindset can seduce you into submitting to a toxic conception of time. I need to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. Oh, I need to... Careful. Um, who says you need to be a millionaire by the time you're 30? Who says you need to have a Grammy by the time you're 31? My friend Tim Bruckner, who's a sculptor, says, the future is a big place. You can't see it all from here. Um, he's got two college-age children. So when I and my colleagues are counseling students here on campus, we have to remind them of that. Sometimes they, they get the senioritis, right? And they get really scared to go out the door. They're terrified, and they book the extra office hours, and they just really want to know, what should I do? We can't tell you what you should do. You're walking into the fog of the future. You're stepping into the unknown, and they're scared of that. You have no choice. There's no way you're ever going to know how the future's gonna pan out for you. And if you're a little frog that just sits on that lily pad and is afraid to jump until you know the fog clears, it never will. You have to walk into the fog of the unknown. Your journey will go better and you will avoid pitfalls if you are lit from the inside. I pursued my career knowing what I knowing who I was, and knowing what mattered to me. When I got the opportunity to go work for Prince, it was pretty scary. It was scary, if I had put it on paper, I never would have done it. It was scary because I was um, going to work for my favorite artist in the whole world. This was my dream job. I had just turned 27 years old. I was moving from California, where I was born and raised, to Minnesota. So I was leaving everyone I'd ever known. I would not know one human being in Minnesota. And <laughs> ooh, it sounds even more scary now, looking at it in hindsight. I'm 27 years old, and I'm being tasked with being the technician for an artist who is poised for astronomical success. He'd just come off the 1999 tour. He was just getting ready to do the Purple Rain movie and uh, doing the Purple Rain album. I'm his audio technician. Me, the, nobody else. It's not like one of a staff, of a whole bunch of them. No, just the, just the one. He moved me from the technician position into the engineering chair right away. But that's really scary. Oh, hell yeah, I'm going for it. Hell yeah, I'm going for it. Of course I am. It's terrifying. But I'm going for it because, so what? I mean, if it, if it doesn't work, I just turn around and come home. It's just not a big deal. You have to be willing to walk into the fog of the, of the unknown, lit from the inside with what you want and who you are, what your strengths are. I knew I could do it. I knew I, knew I, could, I could handle the job. Not that it was easy. Since Malcolm Gladwell, we've talked about this as a truism. It takes 10,000 hours to develop mastery. Is that true? Uh, it it's, probably depends on what it is you try to master and how naturally good or, or devoted you are to it in the first place. The standardized mindset can cause you to lose confidence and hope when you fall behind the institutional pace car. Replace know your destination with know yourself. Know yourself. You may uh, come up to speed on some things faster than others or slower than others. Don't worry about it. This is a, a, a gradient ascent plot. A gradient ascent algorithms are used in global optimization problems. It's f there's a better picture in the book, but that one wasn't available electronically, so I chose something else. Basically, you were, uh, when you embark on your career, you're walking up a mountain. I talk with students here on campus about how the majority of our music production and engineering kids graduate from MP&E, and their plan is to walk up the North Face. The North Face is to just do what everybody else has done, which is go to the Village Recorder. They like our people, and they hire a lot of us. Maybe go to Igloo in Los Angeles. The majority of our MP&E kids go to LA. Some go to Nashville. Some go to New York. Some go to Atlanta, and some go to other places in the world. But the majority of them say, I'm just going to take the easy route and just go up the North Face and just, you know, work my way up 
this path that everyone else has taken. Stop just for a minute. That might be the right path. But can you at least, at the foot of the mountain anyway, go around the mountain a little bit and look for alternative paths. The south face might take you longer, but it might be easier for you. Or the other paths might get you to where you want to be and incorporate the unique profile that is you. Of course I wanted to make records when I was young, but I knew, especially being a woman in 1978, there were very, very few women in the music business. Oh, it's 41 years later. Not that much has changed. <laughs> Well, there are more now. There are more engineers and producers, but we're still working on that. Anyway, uh, the, the, if I had taken the North Face, if I had uh, gone to work as an assistant engineer and tried to work my way up from runner, intern and runner, and then assistant, I don't think it would have worked for me. First off, I would have been really unhappy. Just being there making the coffee and sweeping the floor and going on the sandwich runs, that's how many of our students do it. That's actually how it's done if you want to work your way up to an engineering position. But something inside me just told, told me, no, 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 this just doesn't feel right. I think I'm going to take another path. It ended up being the smartest thing I ever did. The path I took was studying electronics and becoming a technician and going up the tech route. And then it was Prince who bumped me over onto the main path, the north face, by putting me from the technician position into the engineering chair. So I jumped the queue by kind of going through an alternate path up the mountain. That might be the better strategy for you. For some of our students who are older, they can't get jobs or even positions, sometimes unpaid, as interns or runners, because some of them are supporting young children. They need a proper job. They can't take that North Face path. It's smarter to consider alternate routes. Your landscape of excellence is going to be unique to you. So first, look all around you and determine which slope is the steepest. The steepest will be the shortest, generally. Climb in that direction. Then pause, and from your new vantage point, take another look around. You may have to reassess your path and repeat until you are at the top. All of that is in the book. So let's compare the standard mindset with the dark horse mindset. Standard mindset says the pursuit of excellence will lead to your fulfillment. However, the dark horse guys say, no, the pursuit of fulfillment will lead you to be excellent. Standard mindset says, know your destination, work hard, and stay the course. But these guys say, harness your individuality in pursuit of fulfillment. Don't walk in someone else's path, walk in your path. The standard mindset says be the same as everyone else, only better. No, 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 no. Be the best version of yourself. Optimize yourself, such as you are with your flaws and your shortcomings. Optimize your strengths. Rather than be focused on universal motives, you should be focused on your personal motives. Uh, rather than picking and then following your passion, you should choose and then engineer your passion. Don't passively follow it. Make it. Rather than stay the course, think about trial and error. It might be smarter. And rather than think of, thinking of just straight up climb up a ladder, think about that gradient ascent where you go up maybe through an alternate route and then stop, reassess the landscape, and think about if you have to change paths. I recommend to you a Berkeley alum, Derek Seavers. He's got this beautiful little book that I get, keep buying and giving away to so many people because I really love it. It's called Anything You Want, 40 Lessons for a New Kind of Entrepreneur. Derek Seavers was a Berkeley student here in the late 80s, and he founded CD Baby because he thought, yeah, my friends and I, we need a place to sell our music that isn't Tower Records. Uh, he founded CD Baby, and he ended up selling the company for millions. But this little book, it's a slender little volume just a tiny little thing. And there's 40 lessons in there, and they're really brief. So you can just open the book to any page, and there'll be a lesson in there that's really good advice, I think, for young artists today. Uh, Derek Sievers is wonderful. So you can check him out. And that's all I've got for you today, so thank you for listening. Yeah. <laughs>